Hi guys, this is Lauren with Lauren Watkins Art and today I'm going to be painting this landscape using watercolors and this picture is part of my watercolor series I am doing at my local university where I teach in-person classes. When I am teaching those classes I like to make the lessons available online on my YouTube channel in case any of my students miss the class. So let's get started. This is the palette I'm using. Um, starting from the left, I have quidacridone red, cadmium red, gamboge, lemon yellow, I have sap green, phthalo green, phthalo blue, ultramarine blue, violet, burnt sienna, and Payne's gray. So those are the colors I'm using in this picture. All of the colors are from the Da Vinci brand except for the sap green, which is a Winsor Newton Cotman color. And here is the reference photo that we will be using for this picture. And if this picture looks familiar to you, I recently did this using soft pastels. I actually did that picture um, when I was researching pictures for my watercolor class. So now you can compare kind of how I approach things when I'm using soft pastels versus when I'm using watercolor. I started off by taping off my paper and then I am just sketching in the rough landscape of this picture. So I'm showing, I'm sketching in the mountains, kind of where I want the trees to fall. Um, I'm using a light hand so I can easily erase. And then I'll sketch in kind of where I want the clouds to be in this picture as well. So the reason why my paper is taped like this is that top section we use in the class to test practice, to color test our our paints to practice techniques before we practice them on the paper. So I usually tape them off like that. Also having a slightly smaller picture makes it so that we can more quickly move through the picture in the time constraints that the class has. So right now I am mixing our ultramarine blue and our burnt sienna. This makes a really great gray color if you do kind of a 50-50 ratio. If you do just more brown and a little bit of blue then you get more of like a burnt umber color if you do mostly blue and then a little bit of the the burnt sienna then you get almost like a navy midnight blue so i'm just doing different combinations of that and i've also activated a little bit of our phthalo blue this is to add a little bit of brightness i don't want to do a ton of phthalo blue because it's very staining and it is so bright but it will be really helpful in a few areas that I want to kind of pop out a little bit more. So here is a trick I have for you. If you need to wet a large area of your paper quickly, using a spray bottle is super, super helpful because it just puts down so much water and then you can blend it out and make it kind of even just using your brush and it really speeds up that wetting process. And I find it's really helpful on paper that doesn't stay wet for a long time. So the Strathmore 400 watercolor paper that I'm working on is a wood, uh, wood pulp based paper. And it's fine, but it doesn't stay as wet as long as something like Arches or uh, any other 100% cotton paper. So by wetting the paper very quickly, it allows me to just jump right into painting. And that's also why I prep the colors before I do a wet into wet wash. That way I can just take advantage of the paper while it's wet and I don't have to worry about it drying on me. So now I am just um, dripping in and kind of blocking in the sky areas that I want to be a dark blue. Um, I found that the uh, water on the paper was really diluting the paints that I had mixed and so I just made a stronger concentration of that blue and burnt sienna color so that I can really get that moody, dark sky effect. I am making sure that I'm leaving white spots in the sky because that's gonna be where the highlights of um, the clouds are gonna be. And as the paint spreads, it's going to move. And if I don't purposely leave some pretty large white areas that I want the clouds to be, I run the risk of the whole thing becoming blue. So now I have a Payne's Gray mix that I'm using, and this is going to be the shadows, the cat, the shadows on the bottom side of the clouds, um, to really help them start to get dimension. 
and I'm just trying to make sure that this top right side of the sky is a lot darker than the left side. So I'm putting a lot more emphasis on that side to get the contrast up, to get these darker, more moodier blue tones. And then on the left side, that's where I add a little bit more of the phthalo blue, the brighter blue. So it looks almost like a storm is just passing through or it's just about to, to roll in, that type of thing. Um, I noticed my paper was drying a little bit, so I did a little spurt of, of water onto my paper to wet it. And I purposely did it um, so that it would speckle like this because I wanted it to make it look almost rainy and play into the texture that the burnt sienna and ultramarine blue will have naturally because it's their granulating colors. And so when they get wet, they, they create a lot more texture. And so by spurting the paper just a little bit, it helps create different textures within the sky. Spraying the paper also is great for just keeping it wet without disrupting the colors too much. I did have a little bit of a puddle forming in the middle that you saw me dab up with a rag. So if you get too big of a puddle and you're getting standing water, you'll want to kind of absorb that up before it starts drying because that will make some weird textures in your picture. Now, wherever I see the blue kind of encroaching on where the clouds are forming, I am just dabbing it up with my towel. This towel is an old nasty one and it has a lot of texture, so it leaves a bit of a texture in the sky. I was all right with it. A paper towel might not leave as much texture. You saw me tip my board. That was so the water on the paper would move in the direction I wanted it to go. Um, just because it was a lot more wet and I couldn't absorb all of it. So by sliding it into the area I wanted it to flow a bit, it allowed for different kinds of blending and it kept a puddle from forming. And I came in with a little bit more ultramarine blue. The left side was a lot more dry, so I'm just letting some of that water flow down towards that left side to help wet it and using that extra water that was on the paper. And I'm just spraying this down just to keep it from drying too quickly. And this video isn't sped up to a full two times speed or double speed. It's about one and 0.75 speed. Um, I, lots of my videos get sped up to like three or four times speed, but I really wanted to, to show what I'm doing with it and give you a chance to see how the colors are mixing. If I'm going too fast and you're trying to follow along, feel free to pause, watch it and then pause it and, and then come back and watch it again as you go along, just so you don't get overwhelmed by the speed this picture is moving. Um, if you don't want to use a spray bottle, I would really recommend using something like a, a cotton paper to really absorb this water so it doesn't dry it doesn't dry on your paper too much or you're going to have to move very quickly and not do quite as much back and forth because um, just applying the water with a paintbrush um, will mix um, lift up the pigments that you've been putting down too much and it will, can make it a little bit trickier. Um, using the spray bottle is also keeping this picture in kind of the wet into wet stage. So the paints are spreading, they're moving a lot on the paper and it allowed me to get a lot of layering and blending in without getting too sharp of lines just yet on the picture. The pink thing you kind of saw in the corner, that is my drying tool. Um, that helps speed up the drying process in a picture um, because you can get it to where you like it and then dry it. If you're doing really soft blends like this in the sky, um, sometimes it's best to wait a little bit longer before you hit it with the, the, the heating tool or the drying tool um, because then you won't get as soft of blends because it, it stops short that blending process that happens naturally on the paper with the water. So I'm coming in with a little bit more phthalo blue just to get a little bit more brightness and vibrancy and then a little bit more of almost just pure ultramarine blue just to, to not make it too gray and cloudy. I wanted some color some brightness showing through, but I wanted that depth. 
And you can see now as I'm going along, those colors aren't spreading quite as much. That's because my paper is drying. So I'm doing almost like a, a wet into dry technique where the, the paper's wet, but the paint isn't as watery. So it's going to soften a lot on the edges, but it's not going to blend and flare out quite as much as it did at the beginning. Um, as you get more comfortable with watercolor, you'll get really comfortable in knowing how the paint's going to respond by how thick of a concentration of water you do, how wet your paper is, all those types of things. Um, I did one little squirt uh, or spray of water on my paper right before I dried it. That way I really get those textures showing through and then I'm drying it before they soften too much and blend in. I wanted this to be kind of an abstract sky. I didn't want it to be hyper realistic. I just wanted it to be a fun way to build a sky. I think um, there's so many different styles when you're doing watercolor. You can make it really whimsy or you can make it super realistic. And I wanted this one for the class to be a little bit more whimsical and just having fun leaning into the traits of watercolor and embracing it. So I mixed some purple with the burnt sienna and I also mixed some burnt sienna um, with the, the blue and the Payne's gray to get a dark color. If I was to do this again, I would start off a little bit lighter. Later on in the picture, I had to work on lightening this up. It was just a smidge too dark. Um, and I would make it just a little bit more blue and a little bit more gray instead of black. Um, that way it kind of recedes into the distance a little bit more and um, doesn't compete with the rest of the foreground as much. So I will be lightening this up as we go, but I just wanted you to know that even this was like my third time doing this picture. I d did it in some sketchbooks and I did it with pastels that sometimes you still find things that you would do differently. I added a little bit of red and yellow to it to kind of help it blend in. I was feeling like it was just too dark, so I kind of absorbed up some of that pigment with my towel. And now I'm just kind of blending out that base of the, the hills so that it, it doesn't get a sharp line where it meets the, the grasslands that are in the foreground. Adding a little bit of violets. I'm trying to make sure these mountains have the blue tones from the sky, but also some of the warm tones from the grasslands. Since they're kind of in the middle, um, you're going to have lights and shadows on these hills, so I don't want them to be too flat. So I'm just kind of um, trying to find the right balance between those two aspects in the picture. For the grasslands, I'm using a lot of that gamboge color. And keep in mind, gamboge kind of varies on brand a lot, um, more than a lot of other colors. So the gamboge I'm using is almost orange looking in the pan. And I've seen like the Windsor Newton one almost looks like, like an ochre color. Um, some of my students have described it as baby poo yellow. It's not as warm based. So just keep that in mind, like a cadmium yellow deep might be a better color to choose. Um, if your gamboge isn't quite as warm toned as mine is. But I'm just basically using it to get kind of the basic um, base colors of the, the grasslands. I used a little bit of our yellow lemon color, which is like a cad yellow light. And I wanted that for more of the highlight sections. And then I'm just doing mixes of cad red and gamboge and maybe some opposite colors just and burnt sienna just to kind of vary up the colors in this grass and you can see I'm keeping my brush strokes very horizontal and that's because I want the grass to kind of read being in the distance as you get closer then you can start seeing more detail in grass but if it's far away it's going to just read kind of flat. So that's what I'm trying to achieve. I pulled a little bit of the, the orangey brown colors into the, the foothills of our mountains just so that they blend in and we don't get a weird 
like harsh line. And then I warmed up the base of the, the grass or the bottom of the paper with a little bit more red tones. And then I still wanted these colors to mix and move, so I just gave it a little spurt with my spray bottle. And I'm coming in with a little bit of like a blue-gray color just to start adding in some shadows and dimension onto our hills. So I'm just tweaking that a little bit, um, applying a little bit of a shadow into where the trees will be drawn later on. And now I'm gonna clean up the edges um, at the base of the sky where the sky and the mountains meet visually. And I'm just using a little bit of phthalo blue for this just to brighten up that section just a bit. Then I'm picking up our burnt sienna and our blue color and mixing those together. Honestly, those two colors were like the heroes of this painting. And here I am like going back and kind of lightening it up. This was the part of the picture I really, really struggled with. So I'm just scrubbing it. Um, I was gonna mix the blue and the brown together and work on something else, but then decided I just needed to, to tweak these mountains a little bit more. You can tell this was where I really struggled at. I added a little bit more blue to it, tweaking the more distance hill, distant hills. I lightened it up just a little bit, which I'm glad I did because if I had left them that dark to begin with, um, you wouldn't have seen the contrast of the tree we're going to paint on top of it. It would have blended in together a little bit more. So I'm just tweaking this. And I am just like lightly dabbing it. I don't want to like scrub at the paper too much unless I'm trying to purposely lighten up um, a color that I put. Um, just because it can be kind of hard on your paper if you scrub too much. So I got to a point where I felt like I was pretty happy with the mountains. And I'm just adding a little bit more yellow to, to help them blend into the, the foreground a bit pulling that color down. I'm not doing like flat washes with this. I'm keeping some gaps where there's a little bit more of a highlight, a little bit more shadowed. And this is just to help add interest into this foreground so it's not like just reading flat. I know sometimes it can be hard um, when you're doing watercolor painting and things like this because your teacher will be like, you just kind of dab it on and that's not very precise instruction so it can be a little confusing so it can help sometimes to watch what they're doing first and what they mean before you try to follow along and so the video is really nice because you can watch what they're doing pause it go back rewind it watch it again if you're confused and then then try it on your own and then do it with them so that orangey brown color we have, I have started adding some vertical brush strokes and I'm just doing light flicking motions. And this is so we can start building up some of the grass details in the foreground. And I'm making the grass strokes that are like at the very bottom of the picture be taller than those that are a little bit more distant. Because the closer something is to you, the bigger it's gonna look. The the further away it is, the smaller it's going to look. So I'm making sure I'm keeping that in mind as I draw and start blocking in the grass. Proportions make a really big difference on how your end result's going to look in your picture and help you to achieve, achieve the depth you want in your finished project. So proportions make a big difference on creating depth in your picture. Another thing that can help create depth is your color value. So the further away something is, the lighter it's gonna be and the more gray toned it is, um, so and more blue based it is. You can see even just that hill that I drew that's a little bit further behind the main mountains in this picture. It's a little bit lighter than those ones that are closer to us. And the same thing's gonna apply to our grass and any like bushes that I want to imply 
that are in the distance on and on the hills, those are going to be a lot lighter in value. They're not going to be as dark. They're going to be almost gray toned. And I'm just going to do some little tiny dabs to just imply that there are trees and bushes there. And this is just a mix of our violet and our ultramarine blue. And it's not going to be nearly as dark as what I use to paint the trunk of the trees or any of those kind of details. And when you are working on like something in nature, just make sure you're not making anything too systematic. So don't make your bushes or any of those types of things like too similar because it looks very unnatural to our eye and our brains really pick up on, on them being like the same. And so you want some variation in your shapes. You want some variations in your colors and angles and things like that just to really help it look more organic and natural. So like my grass, there's going to be some grass blades that go a little bit different of a direction. There's some variation in height, even just the ones that are in the foreground and the color is going to vary a little bit. That's going to help create visual interest. It's going to help it look more natural and organic because everything's not really the same color all the time. So for this, I have my brush and I did a little bit more of like a dry brush technique um, just to kind of help feather out some of those brush strokes I did. I'm mixing some of our orange tones with our uh, sap green that I had on the palette just to start varying up some of these these grasses and then I'm just helping flick it up with a different brush um, sometimes I'll do that where I'll paint it in with one brush and then have a dry brush that can kind of smudge the edges and feather them out so now I'm making the color that I'm going to use for the trunk of the tree so it's a mixture of our burnt sienna our violet and our ultramarine blue and I am just blocking in the shape. This is something I looked at the reference photo um, at first just so I kind of knew the direction I wanted to make the tree even if it's not exactly like that tree I just looked at it for guidance on how to create the shape and I am just very gently creating the lines branching off of the trunk. Now the biggest rule of thumb to remember when you're doing a tree is that the trunk is bigger than the branches and thicker and so you want your branches that you're coming off of your trunk to gradually get smaller and smaller and don't make them too identical you want to have some squiggly lines you want some branches that are kind of crooked and bent weird you don't want it too uniform so I'm just making it um, I'm blocking in a few other trees the other thing I'm doing is I am not doing all of the branches because I'm going to be painting in some red leaves on top of these and it is really hard to cover up something this dark with traditional watercolors because they are transparent. So I am not doing every branch on the tree. I'm just doing the base trunk and then any branches I add later will be around the clumps of uh, Fe uh, feathers. Yes, this tree is growing feathers. The clumps of leaves on this tree um, and I'll make the branch the, the branches go around that. So for the leaves on my trees, I'm going to make them a little bit more orange and red tone. I know in the reference photo they are a little bit more yellow and orange, but my watercolors are not very opaque. They're very translucent and since I have darker colors in the background between the sky and the mountain, if I use a yellow over the top it's not going to show up hardly at all and it will look almost green because of the blue in the background colors. So I am using my darker reds and my oranges because they will show up on top of it. Particularly my cadmium red. My cadmium red is a lot more opaque. It's not as translucent as like my quadacridone red and I'm using that to my advantage because with it being more opaque I can layer it up and it will cover the colors underneath it and it will 
a little bit more of a contrast. I'm also making sure I'm using my cad red when I am making my orange tones so that my orange has a little bit more of that opacity. And I am just dabbing my uh, paintbrush onto my tree um, chunks that I had kind of painted earlier. And I'm making kind of like clumps of leaves, not too many individual leaves because uh, your trees are one three dimensional. And so the way the leaves and, and the branches look are gonna change based how you look at them. Two, we're looking at it from a distance. So a lot of those leaves are gonna overlap and create a little bit of like a clumps that you see and you'll just see kind of a mass of color and you, you're not gonna be seeing as many individual leaves except for if they are far away or towards the top of the tree. So I'm making sure I'm clumping them. I'm keeping my brush strokes a little bit more random. I'm varying up the value and the colors of the leaves so there's a little bit more dimension within them. And I'm making sure that there's areas where the leaves on the trees are blocking some of the trunk. And I'm making sure there's areas where the background and the trunk and the branches on the trees are kind of poking through. Because if you make it too like solid or a mass of color, then it starts looking a little bit more cartoonish. But if you can have some light showing through or the background showing through and some branches showing and keeping it a little bit more varied like that, your tree is going to look a lot more realistic than if you didn't. I'm also going to pull in some of those red values that I used on the tree into other areas of the foreground and the midground, just to kind of bounce those colors around. It's the same reason why I used the ultramarine blue and the burnt sienna and some of the violet to create the, the color for the trunk of the tree. By pulling in those colors that I used in the sky, even if they're not the same mix, what it's gonna do is create a little bit more harmony in your picture because everything is gonna work together. You've used those colors before in different ways. You can have a color be a standout color. Like if you want red, this something in your picture to be painted red so it becomes a major focus, you can absolutely do that and still add red in your picture in other ways to kind of help it have some harmony. Even if it doesn't look red, but you use it to mix other colors, that red value or that red color by adding it in your mixes in other areas, it will just help your colors work together in a harmonious color palette, if that makes sense. Now I'm just tweaking up, or tweaking up, I'm just tweaking and adjusting the grass areas, um, making the grass that's closest to the tree. Like I'm showing some of the variation in grass height, but it's a lot softer, not as finely detailed, where compared to the grass that is at the very bottom of the paper that's supposed to be closest to us. The closer things are to you, the more detail they have. And so that means you're gonna have sharper, more detailed lines. There's gonna be a little bit more variation that you see. It's not gonna just kind of blend into a mass. And I am making sure I'm keeping some of that variation within this picture um, in the very foreground so that it, it has some visual interest and it looks like you're seeing a whole bunch of different um, grass blades um, in shadow and some of them in a little bit more green tone because they haven't fully dried out yet. By varying it up and having it be a little bit more in focus really helps sell the depth of the picture. Now this picture is almost done and it's getting to that point where you have to look individually at what your painting looks like to see what it needs. So. There's a few areas I thought needed a little bit more depth, a little bit more of that kind of warm yellow color added to it. So I'm just adjusting it as needed. And if I'm feeling frustrated and I don't know what needs to be adjusted, I'm taking a break so that I can come back and look at it with fresh eyes. That can be hard to do in a classroom environment, but it, I strongly recommend it when you're working at home or where you have a little bit, you can take more of a leisurely pace work on it and then if you kind of get stuck take a break go get a drink 
even take the rest of the day off and then come back to it later. And then you can kind of see what needs to be adjusted and tweaked. So I am just doing some more leaf details. I am adding some more reds and oranges to it. I am having some more orange tones be towards the tops of the trees and stronger red tones be towards the bottom of them just because I wanted to show a little bit of variation in color because lots of times when trees um, change in the fall they don't all change at the same pace so you you can have some a tree one tree and have half the leaves be yellow and then some of them be more orangey and still have some green showing through and so I wanted to have just a little bit of variation to show that change. Um, I also um, readjusted and tweaked um, kind of how the leaves were forming on the branches, varying up my strokes to show some trees, uh, some of the leaves on the trees will be a little bit more in the distance and some of the bigger ones are part of the clumps that are closer together um, and closer towards me adding some more shadows on that grass and I'm really just tweaking and adjusting this. Now if I could do this picture again I would one make the mountains a little bit lighter and kind of vary up the shape of them just a bit and you can see now I'm coming in with a highlighter and that's because the mountains were so dark in that area that it was really hard to cover up them with the even the opaque red so it didn't stand out quite as much as I wanted. So I'm just adding a little bit of white highlights to it. If you don't like the way this looks, you don't have to do it. If I was going to do this without the restrictions of using the supplies that are only available to my watercolor class, I would probably use some, um, it's called brisket or it also goes by masking fluid. And I would just apply that in dabs kind of around where I wanted the the tree leaves to be um, so I would have done similar shapes and stuff like what you see the leaves looking like let that dry and then I would have done my washes over the top and then when the washes dried I would have rubbed the frisket off and then put the colorful paints where I wanted the leaves and that would have allowed the colors to be more vibrant because they're not over a darker background and they would stand out a little bit more but sometimes we don't always have frisket, we don't have gouache with us, so this is just an example of things you can do. So knowing which paints are going to be more opaque so that you can layer them up over something in the background. You can know um, if you have a gel pen, you can use that. It's not light fast, but if you're just doing a little sketch like this, it might not be that big of a deal for you. Um, but if I was to go back and do this picture again, I would probably do that or at the very least I would have made the mountains just a smidge lighter than what they ended up and I talked about this earlier I if they were a little bit lighter I felt like they would recede visually just a little bit more and they wouldn't have compete, competed with the leaves on the tree so just something to keep in mind as you're working you can adjust your picture as necessary in the reference photo it was quite dark so I think that's part of why I was making them as dark as it was. But I, I didn't take into account that I was doing this version with watercolor. And you can't cover a dark area as well as like with your pastels. With my pastels, I was able to put a bright leaf over the top. And it actually worked better having a darker tree, uh, darker mountains in the background. But here is the finished piece. And I hope you found this video helpful in kind of seeing how I approach things with watercolor versus pastels. If you've taken the class from me, that you could kind of go back and revisit this video and lesson. And if you want to see more of what I create, please hit the subscribe button. And if you uh, have any questions about this painting, please leave them down below and I will do my best to answer them. I hope you have a fantastic day and I will see you next time. Bye.